Um, this may seem a bit weird to have a microphone out for our little crowd. It's for anyone who's watching online. Hello. Um, uh, thank you for coming out. It's very funny. I'm very nice. Uh, my name is Mary, I run Light House, and it is my absolute pleasure to be welcoming um, William Hussey. Am I saying that right? Hussey well, to the bench show. Thank you. Um, who is the author of the very brilliant, uh, gory, um, grisly, twisty, uh, funny, gothic crime novel that is all of these very many things and more, as well as is it a dozen other books? Yeah, yeah, roughly. Yeah, it's. I think that's number thirteen. So okay. I don't know if that's lucky or not. <laughs> Seems fitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one. absolutely. Um, so we are going to have a little bit of a chat around killing Sherpa, and then you will also have a chance to ask the questions yourself. Um, but before we launch into that, will you all uh, join me in putting your hands together to welcome Lori? <laughs> And um, so, uh, before I want to change my question, and I put words into your mouth because this is a book that um, does defy much characterization, will you tell our readers uh, just a copy of the plot and the Scott Jericho is? So, what yeah, is this book? Absolutely. So, uh, basically, it's uh, the background of Scott Jericho comes from my background. I grew up uh, son of a travelling showman, so I travelled on fairgrounds myself. And I always thought that um, travelling fairground people would make brilliant detectives. And I've got a tiny little anecdote before I get to the plot, which uh, was I was looked after quite a lot in my youth by three aged aunts who were like three weird sisters who lived up in um, a caravan together. And they would run the hook it up stall. Uh, which my great granddad apparently invented that store, which is pretty cool. And he, but they were brilliant because I'd be sitting there playing with a little kind of action figure or something and half listening to them. And they'd be talking about the punters who'd come on their stall during the day. And it would go a bit like this. So one of them would say, Oh, did you see the nurse who uh, came up earlier? And I would say, uh, How do you know she was a nurse? She wasn't in uniform. They go, Oh, when she went to check the time, she did that first before she looked at her wristwatch. So, as the nurse would. And she said, um, and then the other one would say, oh yeah, she won't, that husband won't be with her very long. And you were like, how do you know that? Go, we didn't see his ring finger, like how the knock on his ring finger was worn away from taking his wedding ring on and off quite regularly. And she went, yeah, but she won't be too bothered because she's having uh, something to do with one of the traps who's running the Dodgers. Yeah, how do you know that? Oh, because I was passing the trailer the other day and there were these two little holes in the wet ground outside that just matched the stilettos of her heels that she was wearing today. And it was like, wow, they they were never wrong. You know, the uh, you know, the, uh, the cheating nurse and the philandering husband, that definitely happened. So um, I always thought they would be brilliant detectives and because their observation skills are brilliant, they had to be great observers. Uh, people who came on the fair because they'd only have a couple of hours each night to kind of earn their living and they couldn't waste it on people who were just passing by. So they observed people very quickly. The fair is the last great level. So all human life comes to the fair from thin men to lords. So they get to know people that you are, they suss them out. And they're great at the gift of the gap, like winning people's confidences and just kind of, you know. So all of those skills brilliant. So I always thought that um, a traveler detective would be fantastic. So Killing Jericho is basically about a um, man who's been brought up in the life. He's a gay man, he leaves the life at 18, and through a series of misadventures, he joins the police force. And there's a case that he's assigned where a far right fascist um, group of petrol bombs, a Polish food store and three young children have died in the ensuing uh, arson attack. And Jericho is assigned the case, and he's interviewing this fascist thug, and he just loses his temper and beats the guy up. And so he's drummed out the force. This fascist guy comes after him, sues him in a civil case, so he loses everything. So he's giving the book, he's forced to go back to the background family one trajectory. And he's on a down spiral. And then suddenly a case is brought to him. And so 150 years ago, the 
Jericho family were running a, a freak show in the Victorian age. And there was an accident as one of the loads was going over a bridge in Kent and the bridge collapsed and lots of people, five people drowned. And now, 150 years later, it appears that a murderer is recreating the deaths of these people who died 150 years ago. But the victims apparently have no connection to each other. And it's only Jericho who knows the legend of the story who's able to piece it together and eventually work out who is doing it and why they're doing it. I'm always worried when I summarize her novels that I'm going to give something away. And um, this gets pretty twisty pretty early. Um, on your on the opening page, uh, we we get to meet him, and it is you know we have a combination of first um, traveler jargon, and then him kicking Michelangelo's butt out of his bed. Um, so it's immediately you know nails its colors to the mask. Yes. Um, very gay, very unapologetic. Um, was that was that always? The plan for for you know this to be the Daily Mail's worst nightmare as a detective. Yeah, gay traveler detective. He's he's yeah going to rile up the Daily Mail readership. So he's um yeah absolutely. Um, I grew up a uh, gay man in the uh, traveling playground world, and I would I wanted to present the community in all its positive aspects, and they. Mass, you know, such a supportive community. I would say that I could go to a fairground in Edinburgh if something had happened to me, if I'd been mugged or something, and I wouldn't know necessarily the traveling people on the fairground. And I would give my name, and they would give me a bed for the night and money and help me out. And that's a network all around the country and even abroad. And stuff like that. That's wonderful. However, there's a uh, heap of service in that. So being LGBTQ within the traveling community is a challenge and one that Scott faces and essentially it's why he leads life. It's a lot better than it used to be when I was growing up, but it, it's still so I wanted, yeah, in that first page, <laughs> because also crime, there's a time a minority of crime readers who are quite socially concerned. And that's why. They like crime novels because in a typical crime novel, the world is shaken up, and then a detective comes in and puts the world back to order. In a, the so it's not quite can be quite a socially conservative genre, and I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted it to be you know from the very open page that it's going to be shaken up and it's going to be shaken up at the end, but at the beginning. And again, we can't really spoil it, but. The way that you can understand why, when we find out what's really been happening, why it's still shaken up and not yeah. ultimately resolved in a kind of neat little bow, the way that you know certain readers would like. So, what I didn't, what I wanted people to do was if they saw that on the shelf in a bookshop, to open it up and to actually see for the first page, is that for me or is that not for me? <laughs> because we've got uh, clearly a traveler, he's got the travel jargon, he's uh, just had sex with a guy on the, uh, he works on there as well. So yeah, just proudly yeah, proclaiming what it is. He doesn't treat that particularly well. He doesn't, he no. doesn't. No, but no. You, you do have like the, the damage detected trope yes. in there and then it's sort of subverted. I've never thought of a crime reader that way, but it totally makes sense. Mm. Um, connecting to that and, and genre, um, you're known for your YA, which often has the Beautiful romance streak. You've got gothic horror tropes that, you know, why why crime now? And were you conscious of putting some of that into this book? Yeah, I mean, crime fiction was my first love when I was a kid. Um, so I love virtually every kind of genre of fiction, but crime fiction was my first love. So, um, um, my grandfather used to read me the Sherlock Holmes stories. Yeah, and I was very precocious about Sherlock Holmes. So I absolutely loved it. So when I, I actually got kicked, when I was about eight, I got kicked off the Sherlock Holmes walk in London because I corrected the tour guide uh, about, I said, oh, that didn't happen in the Priory School, that happened in the Abbey Grange. So, but yeah, so <laughs> the American tourists loved it because I was like, 
his eight-year-old correctly. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I always loved crime fiction. I loved Agatha Christie, and I'm a great defender of Agatha Christie because she's um, she gets a lot of flack about the quality of her writing based on Boston, but I mean that's my favorite album is Agatha Christie, but and also the fact that she has got a reputation and deserved in some respects of being a conservative writer who had some problematic, definitely problematic language in some of her books. And yet in probably my favourite Agatha Christie book, which has an echo in Jericho T book this year, The Murder is announced, you've got written in the 1950s, you've got a sympathetic and very beautiful um, lesbian relationship right. with two older women who live together in this village. And you know, and it's lovely, and yet she used to be, you know, there's no judgment in the book right. about it. They're just presented as a very lovely couple. And that's in, that's very subversive in the yeah. 1950s, who don't it? Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I've always loved crime fiction. So, but the thing is, I think because I loved it so much, I was intimidated about writing it. So I loved horror, but I didn't, you know, I didn't revere horror writing to the extent I revered crime writing. I love romance stories and I love adventure stories. So it just took a little while and I've been thinking of Jericho's character for years. The other thing is I was a bit nervous about writing about the community that I grew up in and maybe getting some backlash from them because I was wanting to portray that community in an honest way. So with all the brilliant stuff as well. So it just took me quite a while to get around to it. But, <laughs> but then it meant you could put all the other stuff in it. Too. Exactly. Um, on that note of it being sort of slightly controversial, I mean, you know, hundreds of years of social and specifically police persecution of traveler people and show people. Um, and yet here is a detective. Um, and uh, it is reflect the police is not the solution in a lot of the book. Um, but did you, you know, you mentioned being nervous about making this a crime, a crime book that was rooted in your community. Um, did that shape then what you were able to do with the narrative? Or what you wanted to make sure it did get shown so people would get a, a chance to see something complex but also not falling into all those garbage shows. Well, exactly. You know, so firstly, um, the as I uh, say in the book, up until fairly recently, the traveling, uh, fairground traveling community, because the word travel is a very broad umbrella term and lots of different groups fit under it, but the fairground aspect of it. You would come into the town, you provide entertainment uh, for uh, people for like a weekend, and then it's like, it's like, we've had enough of you now, go. We don't want you here anymore. And so I wanted those obvious parallels that Jericho actually says when he goes into this very uh, kind of like, you know, London, you felt kind of town um, that is very nice and pretty and, and almost chocolate box kind of England. And then as he drives in, he sees uh, protests in very neatly wooded lawns, anti-mosque, anti-Islam. Yeah. And Jericho's like, we are now seen as, as travellers, as a British eccentricity, as a kind of like cutesy thing. Oh, aren't they lovely? But only a couple of decades ago, they would have been run out of town, same as other minorities as you did. And that goes back again to like 150 years the, the tragedy at the heart of the book, the, the, the bridge collapse that happened 150 years ago, is a real thing. So it actually happened to uh, family members of mine. And uh, so they were going over a bridge in Kent, bridge collapsed, it was hot picking season, and the about 30 feet ground. And there was a kind of like thing in the travel community, like, we weren't really wanted there because we, we always thought, oh, we're going to undercut wages. Because that's the thing that's always thrown at any kind of minority uh, group that comes into there. Oh, they're going to undercut wages for everyone else. And it's, you know, and so we'll talk to Bridge Week and, you know, on right. that basis. So, yeah, and 
And the, as far as like the aspect of the police and trust, it's always been an uncomfortable relationship. So Jericho joining, as he says in the book, I think he says, um, I became the nearest, nearest down to a Jew. And I joined the police. And it's, that is, you know, they, they have the word for the gathers. You don't talk to the gathers. And you don't, you know, so, you know, but they still, they still take you back. Yeah. Even after yeah. all of that, they still stay. Yeah. And the police will still kick its tires on its own, you know. Like. Absolutely. And the other thing is, um, I think generally, it's not just the police thing, but generally, people don't have a very deep understanding about the differences between communities under that traveller umbrella. There are, you know, it's, it's yeah. like putting every, like, by putting every single Asian community under that one thing, saying everyone can say it, there's, there's not, there's differences. And, but the, um, yeah, within the kind of like the fairground traveler community, you're tending to get less of the outward prejudice that a lot of other travelers get. But the other thing is, um, what I wanted to do is, I, had, and there may be some, I, I haven't read it. But I had never read a crime novel, or virtually any novel, that had fiction like thriller that had been written by someone with travellers in it, which had been written by someone who was a traveller, who had right. grown up in life. So what you tend to find is, especially see on TV, is you'll see fairgrounds going in someone and you'll read about it, and it will be a, to a totally wrong traveller community who are run the fairgrounds. So they will have things like uh, Romany uh, caravans right. and fairground travel people. They don't have those caravans. We never we'll see them. You know, we read about them. And we, oh, that comes by hacking things of like checkered neckerchiefs right. and things like that. And it, it's so it's all wrong. It's just all gone. So, yeah. But it's that performance that people will, will recognize somehow. Yes. Like, oh, this is in my mind's eye, this is what fairground people look like. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, it's a bit grim. Um, not as grim as the, the crimes <laughs> that are committed. Um, and I didn't realise it was based on a true story. Mm. Um, can you tell us a bit about the process then, the research, whether that was into getting the police side, the investigative side down, um, or, or the other way around, like what it was to go back into your own family? find the roots of this and make it something that would work. Yeah. Like the modern crime. On the police side, I had my friend who my life who works so he was like, I just phoned him up, so is this feasible? And if it's feasible, it can go in. If he's like, it might not, it could happen, that's fine. It's good. I can go up. Because we had a point where obviously Jericho is uh, because of his attack, he got bail conditions. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's not bail, it's um, probation. Mm -hmm. And it was like, he has to go out of the country at one point. And it's like, oh, God, he's not going to be allowed to go out of the country, but he kind of needs to. <laughs> so it, there's, there was a way around it, which, right. but, yeah. which Dave helped me out with. On the actual, it was really fascinating to research because our family, like my great, great, great grandfather, was friends with Tom Norman, who was the Silver King. And he was, uh, around in late Victorian era, and he was the showman who was in the elephant And then he said, and I read his handwritten diary, which had never been published, and it just yet yeah, gave me some insight into you know, that area. And I always say, it's not in any way to excuse that whole aspect, of it, because there is no excuse. It's horrific. We give it people for money is everything. But sometimes you have to look back on an age which we don't live in, which doesn't have the social kind of like safety nets that we have. So for lots of those people, it was these are the choices. You could travel with the fairground and have that awful stuff happen to you and be exhibited and laughed at and ridiculed. Or you could go to the workhouse. Or you could be institutional, or you could die in the street. Those are the choices. 
And what was interesting about, I mean, I don't know whether you've seen the data that digital, you know, the other man in the 1980s, the show that portrayed very abusive um, individuals. In actual fact, there was some autonomy within that thing. So often they were paid better than the showmen who exhibited them. And if they were treated, they could just go to a rival outfit. And so, again, not to excuse it, because it's yeah. horrific, but it's not quite, it's more of a nuanced picture. And uh, so that was really interesting to kind of like read his diaries and um, get the diaries that kept in the family? Yes, okay. kept in the family. And then some, the other thing is, um, so uh, again, going back to kind of like how the, the relationship with criminality, the police, and traveling people. When a, basically a society makes it impossible for a community to earn a living without criminality and then judges for it, what are, what are people supposed to do? So it's quite amusing at the story. So Tom Norman used to go into a city like Edinburgh, for example, out on a Friday just before all the letting agencies were about to close for the weekend. And he especially did it you know, during a long weekend or holiday or something. And he would say, he would go in his best clothes, the very lordly, and he would say, I'm thinking of buying three or four of these shops on the main high street, but I'm only here until Sunday afternoon, and I can drop the keys back to think, but I need to go in there, assess them, I'm only here, and he would flash them cash, so it would look, you know, he wouldn't give them any money, but he'd flash them cash, and they would give him the key. And so what he would do is he'd open show on the main high street in Edinburgh for free <laughs> and take a load of money and then give the keys back on the Sunday and say it's not for me sorry and um, but no one was renting that space legitimately yeah and I remember things like my family like well I don't remember it the stories were that they would go onto the fairground they would basically be living hand to mouth. So sometimes they couldn't afford fuel to power their generators, you know, for their rides and stuff. But they would plug into the uh, nearest lamppost and <laughs> it shouldn't be for free off the nearest lamppost. But it's like, they, was, they would be paying all their taxes and stuff. They'd be scraping a living and living hand to mouth. They would, there was, sorry when my dad was young, there was no social security. You had, because you had no fixed address, we were talking about it before we started, if you had no fixed address, you couldn't get dollar money. So if you, so you, you were pushed into a thing where to earn a living, society won't let you earn a living legitimately. You had to find a weird way of doing it. And um, that was why then, you know, when the police would come on and then I'm hooked. And then they're like, right, well now, how am I going to feed my kids? Because I can't run a bed And now I can't feed my kids. So the police were always seen as the enemy within that environment. And so when Scott joins the police, and Scott, I think in the book, he really joins the police. He's got a massive sense of justice. Like, he doesn't want bad people doing bad things. But he also, it's more to do with the fact that he enjoys the hustle of people. Uh, you know, he, he is not there to, he wouldn't join the police to enforce petty, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day during the, uh, uh, the coronation thing, where the, you know, with the, uh, when the protesters were, and Scott would have been like, come through, come through, more of you the merrier. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, he wouldn't, you know, he's not there for that. He's there to uphold justice and also to solve, he's just craves the public. Yeah, got a real itch for the puzzle. Yeah. Which kind of as a reader gives you the itch for the puzzle. Like you're very invested in the solving to the point where you, as you go along, you become less, well, I became less and less scrupulous about that. I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm also here, but it's not a real human being. It's so you look at the theme. Uh, no, the puzzle in it is, is tremendously well done. Um, and it is, you know, it is interesting looking at, I think the, that awakening to a sense that the police, like how ridiculous it was to see them offloading a bunch of bags from a, you know, and um, I had my first arrest last week. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I feel like a badass entity. <laughs> um, 
because I was asleep and I was dragged out of a tent by my ankle by a, like just garbage dogs by the end. It's like, what are you doing in in the woods harassing people at a peaceful protest? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and I I loved going back to some bits of the book ahead of tonight's conversation and the way he is in the police of the police and yet fundamentally not. The police are not investigating the series of crime necessarily the way that they could or should and it takes him to solve a puzzle or follow yeah. a puzzle. I think he's kind of mentor in the I think he says it or unless I figure it out, I'm not quite sure, but it, it, it understand that his view of Scott is you're a great detective and a terrible police <laughs> because they are two very different things. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, in terms, again, of sort of genre and piecing things together, and I'm sure that you will probably also have questions, and I haven't checked. How are we doing for time? Yeah, right. And then I'll also check with my piece. If you have questions online, then feel free to check them up. Um, in terms of piecing all those little bits together um, and the little bits of your own history and then feel free to grab it and share it for one um, Mining what could could go in. Um, was there any line that you sort of thought Scott Jericho could cross or a piece of, um, you know, jargon? Was there, was there certain aspects of just the language that is used? by show people that it's not like I can give you a glimpse at this world, but I'm not going to show you everything. Or I'm going to give you a taste, but I'm going to leave you wanting more. Was there like counsel too far? Yeah, I mean there's so in book two we get to explore a different aspect of the um, the traveler world, which is about the side of it that deals with a kind of almost mysticism. So I can kind of give you like a little idea of book two because it's um, be out in uh, February, but it's um, a, a murderer who's targeting psychics, mediums, fortune tellers. And at the end of this book, it's like Scotty, like I am done. I'm done with this. I'm like, but then this uh, to make the mistake of targeting someone close to Scott, so a, a fortune teller who is worse by one of the bear. And uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> you don't do that. So. Um, but it's um yeah there are loads of different aspects of, that we only really scrape the surface yeah. of as far as like the community is concerned the, again it's more explored in book two but when it hits home to them if you hurt one of them you can you don't want to do that basically and like they will again it's a very frank discussion like, within the book to what uh of what the community response to that be like and scott knows as well so his investigation, as he says to Harry in the loving trip, but his investigation is not so much fueled by his rage, someone to hurt someone's place in the community, but it's also to protect the community. He knows what they do to protect someone who hurts one of them. So it's kind of like, you know, it's, there, there is a sense, and I don't never want to push it too far, because it's not, it's not true to say it's. Um, themselves that's not entirely true but they have their own rules and sets and standards that you know, for better good or ill you know, they abide by um but yeah so that would be more exploited book two we've got some more different jargon in book two as well so yeah one of my favorite ones that sounds so kind of like evocative words is melody so if something's melody it's scary or spooky or unsettling so uh yeah yeah so it's going to be as like unsettling gothic -y. it's going to be a okay. melody <laughs> so, what? so yeah it is yeah it's um yeah so as i say it's a zero killer it's, it's apparently targeting uh, people and is i i can't really say because his methodology is one of the ways i can't really say much uh, how it's murdering so, yeah. yeah, it's only slightly disturbing how creative it gets with the death. Um, <laughs> does anyone in the room have any questions? Yeah, go for it. Um, you have another book out this week as well. Yeah. And I think as a writer, for me, 
I will struggle to so I've already played with Twitter, but I will struggle to like that many. So you've got to very different genre that a very small like window. How do you definitely write the subject? Do you do you get way too much on the other? And for the aspect of right, well, when I love the outreach for the young adults, that seems more for adults. How do you definitely discover the right one right mark for them? Yeah, it's a good question. And also they're coming out very close together, but they they actually weren't written very close together. So it's kind of it's just how publishing schedules work. And um, but yeah, I think it's basically just because how I approach it, like someone said to me the other day, do you approach um, writing for kids differently these days? And I don't really because it's um all I do is I love lots of different genres of fiction. I love YA, I love adult crime gory horror, all kinds of stuff. And I just kind of sit down and think, right, I'm re I'm now going to approach this as a lover of this type of book, and what would I like to read within that genre? And when I do the YA stuff, so when I do this stuff, I I write YA stuff hopefully as intensely as I write this stuff, and then I leave it to my editor to kind of say to me, you need to be pull back on this, or this is a bit too much. Especially in the outrage, because there was lots of violence in the outrage. In the fashion of Britain, and it's, you know, it's a few weeks from now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 30 years from now, which was, you know, looking back on it, it was much too far in the future. But it was, um, you know, there's lots of violence in that, and um, we had like a lot of debates with my brilliant editor about how far we can go with it. And my, my thing is that I think teenagers have a very few antennae when it comes to them being patronized or spoken down to or being coddled. And um, so I try, I just go as far as I go and then I trust an editor to draw me back when they feel they need to. And, but obviously with these ones, I can go as far as I like and then we can have kind of like people with uh, helium balloons for eyes and things like that. So, uh, <laughs> but also, we were saying before this, there are instances of violence in the book, but actually, a lot of the time, you, you might close the book and think, oh, there was some, I saw some really gory horror and murders. You don't see anyone murdered in the yeah. book. You find the discovery of the bodies or the bodies are, you know, a scene of crime, scene of photographs, but you don't actually yeah, and you, you encounter like the way that he sees them. Yes. So you're almost piecing in, you don't get the full scene, you get bit by bit as he looks his way around a photograph or a Yeah, or a crime scene or whatever it might have to yeah. be. But the other thing is, um, so we had a lovely review in Times recently, and uh, it was um, it was great. And there was uh, one of the uh, little lines which I could have been seen as a criticism was it said, um, uh, something about the ending being a bit kind of like over the top or something like that. But I think it was, the review was saying it in a way that was kind of a compliment because it's a, it, it, it's kind of a heightened reality. The book is a right. kind of like gothic horror story in a way, as well as a uh, detective story. And one of the so what I wanted to do with the book was to encompass three different genres of crime fiction. That I love. So one was Birth of the Detective Story, which is their ground phone, Murders in the and which is a horror story, you know, a brutal, violent, but very elevated kind of like um, heightened reality. Like, I wanted that. I want it. I love Agatha Christie, so almost like the bloodless puzzle mystery element. But I also loved um, uh, Raymond Chandler. Okay. Philip Marlowe, private investigator type stuff. Who and Philip Marlowe hated I think everything. He actually said once that um we murder on the Orient Express, he said it's so ingenious that only a half wit can solve it. <laughs> Which uh, a bit rude, really. But um but I wanted to kind of try and bring the gothic horror element to the kind of PI thing of uh, Philip Marlowe yeah. and the uh, the kind of puzzle and the back of Christie and try to make sure yeah. we get them one book. Yeah, and I think also it never gets too much because there's an immense tenderness, I think, for for Harry, for his love interest, um, even in the relationship with his 
father in all of the like the little moments or little insights like his great love of libraries um born of many sets uh, <laughs> fed by many sets rather um so yeah so so between you're not sort of steeped in the horror but you're sort of dangled over the cliff edge yeah. by him along the way with all the other stuff that makes you really invested in someone who is very damaged yeah. and problematic and yes you know, and i think, I think like, yeah and like i think scott would even like say that he's problematic because, <laughs> you know but the other thing is um, so when i was talking out how it was back then and then when i started to think about it i thought we need we need him now because it's too dark okay. without him and you were right yeah <laughs> yeah and he's like i have so many i've had like lots of readers say to me but it were and you say so there's a dog as well from webster yeah. like this lovable old yeah. dog and they like they said we love scott but you can really do what you like him because we kind of like him he gets damaged <laughs> but please don't do anything to harry or webster yeah, yeah. If we heard him towards the ending, I'd say. Like... <laughs> don't know the dog, don't have a gay boyfriend. <laughs> do the um, do we have any other questions in the room? There was also one online that I can see seamlessly. Um from Joe asked, uh, in the movie it's the book, uh, it is very cinematic. Um, apart from the book, which is it in the movie of the book, who plays Scott Jericho? Who plays Harry? Oh, wow. Um, well, uh, oh, thanks, Joe. <laughs> so, uh, my partner Chris is here, he's a brilliant artist, <laughs> and he drew Scott Jericho the first. So, we've had a competition, yeah, and it's, it's brilliant. And he, he almost like just plucked into my mind, and that's what he looks like. And so I feel he's a little bit like uh, Pete Turner, maybe the guy who played Paul Dark in yeah, Paul okay. Dark. But he needs to be a little bit bigger. <laughs> he needs to be a little bit beefier because he's a bit of a beefy guy, yeah. uh, Scott. But um, I think we, I, for Harry, I really, I really don't. So it's a fun thing. Um, I don't know. If anyone's got any suggestions, let me know. But I can't think. Someone Everyone's going to send their suggestions after exactly. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely get that sort of breeding, pull dark, curly, dark curls thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, built like a brick should have. Yeah, yeah, we, um, yeah, he's, uh, that's the other thing, we kind of, we set out what he looks like. Said to me, uh, and he, he did some uh, romance novels as well. He said, 
you go to a horror convention, a horror event, and they are the nicest people you can ever imagine because all their darkness is filled out. <laughs> and you go to a romance uh, thing, and it's like the worst human being you've ever met in your entire life. They have to be lovely all the time. And then it's like, <laughs> so it's almost a catharsis, I guess. You know. It's all out. It's all out. Yeah, exactly. Until the next book. I know this is why these books need to be a success, and we need to get you know, we need to have a contract for three, but we need to because for my own sanity, I need to keep writing them. Let it all hang out. I know, I know. Um, I love that. Um, we're running our first ever and Scotland's first ever romance festival. In June, oh so I will I will brace myself <laughs> for some salty bitches. Um, <laughs> then we'll do horror. Uh, you know, crime areas. Well. You're right. Crime writers are always a really crime and horror. A really uh, jolly really, match. Really nice people. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, there is romance in Killing Joke as well. I yeah. Guess. So yeah. you know. Yeah, you could, yeah, all you all know, of your other books you've distilled like. Yeah. The good stuff because again there's that there's a statement on on fascism the rise of right yeah. you've got the the uh the ugliness of little britain uh in there and the romance yeah and the horror and the gothic things that almost go on for the night yeah and big they're... mansions fires <laughs> yeah and i kind of like i always wanted as well because in the book Jericho is haunted by the um, children who he feels that he let down because he, by him attacking the prime suspect, you know, the case collapses. So these kids didn't get justice and he, he sees them. Mm -hmm. And um, I always wanted it to be open in the book. Are they real or are they part of his PTSD hallucination? I never wanted definitive answers to that. And that this book, in a way, is a kind of exorcism, kind of almost like uh, because in book two there will be other ghosts. So uh, unlucky, but Jericho. I know it's always going to be haunted. You know, what is Harry letting himself in? He's a very deeply loved. But he's very handsome as well, so And <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have oh yeah, we have a mask. Go for it. You mentioned that you've got three books, so mm -hmm. do, do you know where the end of the old three is or where to look good and how people might see the book well you maybe the end maybe Yeah. Uh, well I do yeah, I know book two's finished and I know uh it's gonna happen in book three. Uh, and it will, I'm writing it as a, effectively a, a trilogy, but with an idea for book four as well. Uh, so it really just depends on how well the students and where they'll be getting to what I hope so. Um, it's been going so well, pretty well so far, first few weeks and stuff. I think um, I did, what I tend to do is I read reviews for maybe about the first couple of weeks and I stop reading them. Um, but I think it's uh, not a good idea to start changing characters and storylines according to individual reactions because it will be so contradictory as well. And um, what I tend to do is just sit down with my agent, tell him my ideas, and gauge his reaction because he's like absolutely brilliant at story construction, especially for all agents are. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, the only thing that I've been instructed, which I'll, I'll kind of stick to, is well, all I can promise is Webster will survive all three books. Um, we cannot hurt Webster. I, my only regret with Webster is the regret Agatha Christie had about Burrow is that he was old when she started writing about him. He was in his 60s. So when he died in 1970, he was supposed to be like 143 years old. <laughs> My regret is that Webster is an old dog at the beginning of Killing Jericho, and I basically can't. He's going to have to be an immortal dog. He's no one to give. Like, well, 
what grade is he? He's a boxer. Um, he is so quite old. I think he's about 12. <laughs> okay, we'll turn this back. Oh, oh, he's gonna be five. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> he was called Webster after um, so Bob's mom, who you don't know why she's a big boy tractor. She called him Webster after the playwright like John Webster because he's like a story of Strathfield and playwright. And Webster just loves killing the rats on the fairground. So he's a yeah, very literary animal. <laughs> the glorious creature. The glorious creature. And and just on that note around like you know the role that your agent has played in the publishing process and the book did you have any pushback or were you you know because you you write queer books um you know there's, there's clearly an audience um but there's, there's a lot more in that were you concerned that you know pu the publishing industry rather than readers would be like there just isn't going to be the interest for, 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 a, for a, a queer traveler yeah yeah, I well, think like you can have one, but you can't have both. Well, yeah, I think that that um, uh, Bonnier uh, never, ever, to their credit, said anything about that. Um, and I could imagine other publishers would have kind of thought, yeah, it's it's too it's like too much. But it's kind of like you know, so about six, five, it might be a bit on the edge. This, but about six years ago, really much, uh, 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 had my own book, which had a uh, character called Noah, who's an unapologetically gay text work in the net. And so there have been gay, very central texts before. But yeah, I mean, it isn't, it, it, unfortunately, this is the world we live in, it is going to put some people off. And I think the other reality, which is again in Craig Bonnier, is um, it's going to limit the number of the other areas where we can sell it. Because if you have like a group of old, white, alcoholic, straight detective, then you can sell that virtually any foreign territory, it's absolutely fine. Right. But you know, we can think of territories where this might be a challenge. Um, so, you know, all credit to the Really get behind it, and so you know, I've been really blown away by or by they produce a hardback, which is yeah. very difficult for, especially for Daisy. I've been I've been yeah. writing for like a day Daisy Prime, yeah, and they've done an amazing job to cover. Yeah. And they've been the other thing. What I love about it is they've been really brave and bold by taking on this story, but also. Like to really get behind the vibe of it and to not cut out the book, it's like so many other crime covers, which is yeah. just a shadowy detective with a, you know, just a dark blue cover or something like yeah. that. It, when you see that on kind of a crime shelf, it does pop. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. It's also got like a million accolades. You, you've been <laughs> very well read and quoted. Yeah, bless them. I didn't have to pay them very much either. <laughs> No, they it's were like a lot of crime mates, or like they were like everyone's gonna read this. And I suppose it is it's a very new proposition. If you read and love crime, then there's something really original in what you were saying. Yeah, I mean some of the one or two of the people I knew and approached um, myself and said, yeah, I'm just fine. Yeah. Like Sarah Pimber has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Um but a lot of the others I didn't know. And the only other one who was just and he was really busy finishing his PhD, so he's doing it with Sean Connolly. Okay. And his. He's doing his PhD. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And his Charlie Parker, um, a real model for me for um, Jericho, that kind of PI and kind of lone wolf. And, I mean, there's a lot in common, I think, between that genre of the story and the old fashioned kind of um, Western, like the, the lone gunslinger who comes into town, no one knows, knows who he is in the community, he writes the wrongs and then he's gone again. And this was, in a way, how I pitched Jericho to uh, my agent uh, my agent and to my editor is um, the kind of like the idea that 
the fair, who, who, do we, who do we have now who is like the Levin government, who tra can travel anywhere, who's not like other pets who are pinned down to a city, as great as all that is, like, yeah. like Rebus is in Edinburgh and uh, Morse is in Oxford, and they might travel a little bit, but with this guy, he can go anywhere. Yeah. And he is like, I say, that lone gummy who goes in town, no one knows him, and he sorts stuff out for good or ill, but he impacts the community, and then he's gone again. Yeah, and I suppose he's not tied in a disgrace police officer. Mm. He's served his time in jail. So he has the freedom of everything that would have come with connections and knowledge and training in the police while not being tied to the procedure. Yeah, and in book two, we get a glimpse of that little hiatus period that he had between. So he goes to Oxford, so he leaves. And he wants to go to Oxford because he wants to talk about. I had this experience when I went to university. You go to your university, you're from a traveling fairground background, and what you want to do is talk about books and literature and that world. And as soon as you mention you're from a traveling fairground, all those people want to do is talk about your world. You don't want to talk about that. So he has that, and then he meets Harry, and then that guy starts to be completely wrong. And then he has that little hiatus, which he only touches on in the book about he was in virtually the criminal underworld, and he was like a for hire before he joined the police. But we find out a lot more about that part of his life, too. Are there any left burning questions? Well, you can always um, come up and ask a question if you're too tired to in front of everyone. Um, uh, I should check online, but um, we'll find those online. Uh, but will you join me finally in uh, a big round of applause, a big thank you, and um, happy and congratulations on